Hello and welcome again to Classic Motors, the Ford Motor Company, of course, the providers of the cars that most people in Britain used to drive. With Ford Anglia, one of their all-time greats. Now, Leon Sene from uh, Belgium, you've chosen an Anglia to race. Why that? Well, when I was 18, uh, the Anglia was my first car. And I always loved motorsport, so it had to be an Anglia to race. Well, of course, one of Ford's greatest sporting machines was the GT40. Will Hoy reports on that now from Alton Park. As a motorsport mad juvenile delinquent, one of my first big wants was Ford's now classic GT40, one of the world's first great supercars. Unfortunately, Father Christmas never came up with the goods, but to have one for a day just 30 years after Ford's first victory Le Mans is better than never. And the first car rolled out in 1964. At its first Le Mans, it broke. The following year, 11 GT40s were entered and still none finished. Finally, in 1966, with 13 cars entered, Ford secured a classic 1-2-3 finish, the first of four consecutive Le Mans victories. This particular car was built in 1965, so it's very close to the Mark I car, which won Le Mans in 1968. In fact, Graham Hill had his butt on this very seat. The first impression as you climb into this car is how low it is to the ground, all important in that quest for straight line speed. In fact, the 40 of GT40 means just 40 inches high. There are some cars you climb into that give you that instant feel-good factor, without even so much as a blip of the throttle. This is one such car. The instrument panel looks as though it might have been a bit fumbly in the middle of the night on the Mulsanne Strait. But my favourite is this, the horn. <coughs> Out the way, damn Ferrari. And you might ask why I've got cotton wool with me. Well, it's the stick in your ears because here comes the really good bit. That's the sound of a 4.7 litre engine. This car is not made for deep, meaningful conversation. My initial driving impressions are that it has amazing poise, balance and lightness of touch for a car that is 30 years old. Acceleration is noisy and attention-getting. I'm told the Mark II version of this car was capable of over 230 miles per hour at Le Mans. Which brings me to the problem. The brakes. There's no way I'd want to sit in this car on the Mulsanne straight and brake for the corner at the end of it. They are absolutely appalling. To be fair though, they're old and they're cold, but it feels like they wouldn't even stop a moped. Now that I've stopped grinning and my ears are reattached themselves to my head, before I get out, let me show you something which I think is a bit spooky as a racing driver. These here are the fuel tanks, 20 gallons either side. Nasty business. The whole car is based on a steel monocoque chassis. It's got a parked tin bodywork with fiberglass front and rear. And this is where the noise comes from. This is the engine bay. And this is the engine not only proved reliable, but fast enough to win four victories at Le Mans. OK, it hasn't got the grip of a modern racing car. Not helped, actually, by the hard tyres on this car. We had, incidentally, are fitted to real knock-off magnesium wheels. No Nambi Pambi air guns here. Just good old sweat and a big hammer. Part of Ford's brand plan was to build road variations of the race car and to capitalise on their racing success like Ferrari did and still in fact do. Well, it didn't work. Probably because the road cars were barely distinguishable from the race cars and they lacked basic creature comforts. Eventually, Ford pulled the plug. Partly because their new project, the Ford Cosworth V8 Grand Prix engine, was beginning to clean up in Formula One. Shame. So that was Will Hoy moving very fast in that GT40. I'm now with Debbie, the proud owner oh. of this Capri. How Thank long have you, you had the Capri? About six months. Are you a bit of a fanatic? Oh yeah, I love the Capri. Is this the first one you've had? No, no, I've had about four Capris in the past, but never a Mark one. Wow, and, and do you do all the work yourself then? A little bit. And it, well, are you quite good under the bonnet? A little bit. And is this, uh, is this the colour, the original colour yes, of it? Yes, yeah, it is the original colour, right. yeah. yeah. And what would be your absolute dream car to the have? The Mustang Mark II. 
And why the Mustang? Well, this originated from the Mustang. Oh, did it? Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. And how fast did they go? This one? Yeah. When it came off the, um, the line, it would do about 92 miles an hour. That's pretty but I don't good. go over 50 now, in it? Good for you, lass. Who'd have thought a few years ago a car like this would have been a classic car? Let's think about today's cars. What's going to be the classic of tomorrow? Let's have a look at the DB7 and the Jaguar XKA and let you decide. This is Western Manor in Oxfordshire. It's originally the home of 11th century monks. It's now a thriving hotel called Western Manor. And it manages to combine the power of history with the panelled rooms. It's even got its own ghost called Maud. It has everything you would expect of a period house, and yet at the same time offers modern facilities without which it wouldn't hold its customers. The panelling, of course, wasn't original. It was added somewhat later. And by all accounts, the ghost was really a local lady who came to entertain the monks. And what's this got to do with motor cars? Well, we're expecting much the same of our current crop of sporting pedigreed motor cars. There are lots of pieces of history woven into them and lots of criticisms because there is. Come and see for yourself what we have through this arch. Here we have two motoring legends, both trading heavily on their pasts and both attacking the modern marketplace ferociously. There's a difference. It's about £40,000. And if you're a fan of one or the other, you feel pretty strongly. The one thing is certain that until now, these two cars haven't been shown together very often because they do look so similar. In the blue corner, we have the XK8. Jaguar's new glamorous car, complete with its brand new V8 engine and carrying those famous XK initials that is part of its history. And in the silver corner, we have the DB7, the seriously glamorous best-selling Aston Martin, complete with its 3.2 supercharged engine, equally well trading on its DB past. Considering the £40,000 price difference between them, they're not really rivals, and yet they are in exactly the same market. Which is best? Which would suit you if you were dreaming? In 1961, Jaguar launched the E-Type in Geneva, the motor show. And with all the suitable show business finaz, they did the same thing again in 1996 with the XK8. Now, driving this Jaguar is definitely an experience. You get the feeling that it's a sports car. You have the long bonnet, you have the big sexy wheel, all the instrumentation you want around you. And yet, in fact, the gear changes are so smooth that you really don't know which gear you're in. It just glides. So that was Jaguar's offering. And this is the Aston Martin. Yes, it's based on the same platform. It was still an XKS in its, in its nucleus. But this was designed by Ian Cullen, who had a DB4 in the design studio with him throughout for his own inspiration and to make sure that he perpetrated all the same things. These lines on the sides, which were on those cars, the headlight fairings, all the same styling codes. The style is beautiful, it's slippery, it's very, very fast. But it does trade on the past. Its grand touring credentials are adequate. They're not as good as the Jaguars, but they are weekend equipment at the very least. Now this one may cost an awful lot more money than the opposition, but when you actually start stirring these gears, you know why. The supercharged engine develops over 300 brake horse and it's there all the way through. It doesn't have the excitement of a turbocharger which will suddenly give you a belt in the back. It's there right the way through. And if you love motoring and if you've ever dreamt of an Aston Martin, 
this is definitely the one. I've driven this car and the Jaguar for a thousand miles for next year's Stanley Classic Car Yearbook, trying to judge whether they genuinely are future classics or whether they're just trading on the past. It seems, having had both of them for a serious period now, that both of them have succeeded just as that hotel has in encompassing the ghosts from the past and the best of what is in the future. It really is a delight to drive a car like this and thank God Ford have put the money into both of them. So, which one would you buy? There's definitely horses for courses. There are followers of Jaguar and followers of Aston Martin and those people will always be sure which they would buy. The truth is that these are both grand touring cars. The Jaguar will undoubtedly take you from A to B in great style and great comfort and you'll arrive at the other end quickly and safely. The Aston Martin truthfully is flawed. It will do the same thing. It will be a little bit more rugged about getting you there. The gearbox is definitely a bit of a struggle. The pedals are a bit of a maze. But if your passion is for driving hard and the corners invite you, then in the end, it's going to be the Aston. There isn't a clear winner between these two because they are genuinely designed for different markets. A very shrewd Ford Motor Company saw that both these companies needed more money than they could individually justify. They've used a basic idea and taken it in two different directions. And it's the Ford Motor Company who are in the end the winners because they have found in the Aston Martin DB7 their all-time best-selling Aston. It's an, a younger age group than the other Aston drivers and therefore they will keep them. And with Jaguar, they have done exactly the same thing. The Jaguar is now the best-selling Jaguar sports car of all time. And both these are new. Just like Maud, who haunts this place, so the histories of Aston Martin and Jaguar are haunting these two models. We don't mind that any more than we mind the ghost or the panel room. We enjoy those elements of the past, as long as the service and what you get from them is good. And with both these two, Ford have definitely found winners. John Stanley there. From those two, my favourite would have to be the Aston Martin, but not the modern DB7. I like the earlier DBs. DB5 here was an absolute classic. John Timoney and a, a beautifully um, aged Aston Martin DB5. That's I mean, very this is... kind of you, thank you. <laughs> but I mean, so many cars are over restored, aren't they? I mean, yeah, definitely. Um, this one is, is used every day, sometimes to go to work as well and through traffic. So it's the way they should be, I think. When did you first meet up with this? Uh, about a year, year and a half ago, and uh, not looked back since. People say that you, you've got to be a sort of millionaire to run an Aston Martin, is that true? That's not true at all, actually. I, I find them quite economical. I mean, I've had far, far thirstier cars in the past, but um, and admittedly they do cost a little, little bit every now and again. Anything old does, as I can testify, but uh, they're not so bad, actually. And, and what's the appeal of the DB5 for you? Um, all I can think of at present is Sean Connery, which isn't going to make me sound very intelligent. But it's just, it's a classic shape. Um, it's the line and the design of the thing. I mean, when you walk out to it first thing in the morning, what, what do you think when you look at it? Well, you have to allow about usually an extra hour on the journey because that's the, the time it takes me to walk around the thing and just admire it and <laughs> pinch what, myself. And... Even after a year? Oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. And I mean, you know, your leather work has... Um... <laughs> Slightly worn. I mean, are you going to go back to Mr. Connolly and redo all this, or are you going to leave it? I as think it is? we're going to have to pay Mr. Connolly a visit at some stage because bits of the seat are leaving with me when I get back out of the car. So I think that's on the cards, but I do need to put some pennies away first. Okay, we'll take a break now. Join us in a few minutes for more Classic Motors. While you've been watching the ads, I've been intrigued by this little FMR here, and I've got Jim here to tell me all about it. Is this yeah, your... Uh, it is indeed, yes. How long have you had it? This, I've had about, what, uh, ten years. What's the most people you've managed to fit in it while well, you've it been... Well, it fits two and It a fits half. two. Can I have two. a little sit in? You can. And how many miles have you done in this, Jim? Oh, a lot of miles. Uh, well, during the summer, I would say... Uh, varying, it varies. I do up to four to five thousand miles a year during wow. the summer. I don't run it in the winter. 
No but, well. Uh, I go to charity shows and uh, all over. Mm. And you drive it everywhere you oh, go. Oh yes, definitely. And what kind of speed are you doing in it? Well, uh, uh, I, I could usually go to about fifty. Fifty. Yeah, yeah. Through rain and storm, the car keeps going. Yes. Well done, Jim. What happens if you want to buy your own classic car, a beauty like this? Steve Bokins is going to find out. I've often heard it said that buying a house is the most stressful thing in this life you can ever undertake, apart from the obvious exceptions, the weekly shopping, arguing with traffic wardens, or trying to decide what you want to drink when someone else is buying. Buying a car, on the other hand, can and should be an altogether more pleasurable experience, especially if the car will be a hobby rather than mere transport. Start looking, however, and you'll be absolutely amazed at just how many cars there are out there. Forget the net, unless you're looking for something really elusive, like the one and only 1948 Wensleydale Weekender Roadster GT, or something equally improbable and rare, you'll find all you'll ever need right on your doorstep. I mean, look. A Volvo 262C Coupe. Styling by Bertoni. More wood and leather than you can shake a stick at. V6 power and real rarity. There are only two and a half thousand of these ever imported in this country and most of them now gone. So when you've restored this one, it's a classic waiting to happen. Something for the weekend perhaps. A Daimler Sovereign Coupe. The absolute epitome of British class, style and elegance. A 1952 Humber Super Snipe. Heavy engineering, heavy restoration and heavy bills. A 65 Austin Westminster. A family car from another era. Oh, what a lovely smell. Or how about a 1980s icon, the Autobahn storming BMW 635 CSI Coupe. But as the advert says, this one needs tidying. But if spending long, cold, miserable hours in a dark garage with bleeding knuckles and oil under your fingernails isn't your idea of fun, and your wallet's filled enough, you could come to a garage like this and pick the classic car of your dreams. They start at about 5,000 up to 45, 50,000, depending on the make and the, and the model, obviously. Now, they're all gleaming. They look like new. Are they as good as new? Some of the cars that we sell are, are restored to a, a better standard than new. Um, a lot of them we sell are to a, a very good day-to-day -day standard. So you could use them for normal motoring? You could, if you're prepared to put up with the idiosyncrasies of the older car, but certainly, people do. Why not have a try on something? We've got a, we've got a lovely old Rover outside. Have a go in that. Lead on.
if you're hoping I'm going to make a recommendation, forget it. With all that choice out there, do you really think I'd want to spoil your fun? Happy hunting. More from Steve Vokins next week. Of course, if you're lucky enough to open the doors of an old barn and find a beautiful Mark I or Mark II Jaguar in there, you're going to be a very lucky person indeed. Somebody who knows all about running a Mark I 3.4 is Don Law. So Don, the beautiful twin cams of a classic Jaguar, what's the appeal of this Jaguar saloon to you? Well, to me, um, I owned a Jaguar saloon when I was a youngster. When I left college, it was the first car I bought. You were a rich and, student. Uh, well, not really in those days. <laughs> 500 pounds would buy a decent Jaguar saloon. Yeah. And uh, of course, you know, 10 times that much these days, of course. I mean, they, they, they were the sort of uh, the gangster's getaway car par excellence, weren't they? Well, I think at the time, the, with the Sweeney on television, you know, on the old 3.8 S-types, uh, they were definitely the car to have in the day, for sure. What's the, I mean, this is a Mark I, and uh, wh why did you choose to, to run a Mark I over a Mark II? Well, I think with this particular car, uh, we bought this car for Goodwood. It's very difficult trying to find a car that you can actually run in a meeting like that. And uh, this one was available, and we knew that it would get an entry, so that's why we took a Mark I. But, you know, they're a very attractive car, I like the Mark I. I think the Mark II's been well photographed, well documented, and, and I think it's nice to have a change, to have something a little different. I always think, you know, you know the sort of the chrome window surrounds around the Mark II sort of looked a bit naff, and this, the, the Mark I had a much better window line. Yes, they do. I think uh, they, they sort of play around with the modern Jaguar saloons these days, don't they? One minute they've got chrome window surrounds, and the next minute they paint them black. But uh, I think this has a, a very classic feel and a slightly different appeal from the Mark II. Well, that's all from this week on Classic Motors. Our time is up, but time is never up for the MGB. You can buy anything from this car for a new body shell to a new rim round the headland. So it, unlike us, will go on forever and ever. Bye bye for this week.